Okay, so hi everybody. Um, good evening for those who are in Germany or in Europe and uh, good day for those in the US. Uh, my name is Jana Lipinkova and today I will talk about um, text to SQL and specifically how we can use text to SQL to converse with the data that we have in our companies. So today we will focus specifically on data for product development and engineering, but in general, the framework that I will present, it can also be adapted and used for other functions in the company. Um, just to set the background here, so this project is pretty new. I will present a proof of concept on which we have been working um, in the last two months. So it's definitely not the full functionality of uh, the product that we envision, but I really hope also to present the approach, but also to indicate um, the future ambition and the future roadmap and basically to show you a vision of the whole functionality that we want to achieve. Okay, so let's go quickly through the um, agenda. First, I will start with the motivation behind why we implement text to SQL. And this motivation is really to help people and ourselves reduce their use of too many or too complex software tools in our daily work, work life. Then we will see how we can achieve this using text to SQL. And we will also go a bit more into the technical details behind text to SQL. So text to SQL is really a niche topic so far, especially when we look at it from the perspective of more um, modern and advanced AI methods. And this is why for us, it has been a very explorative journey so far. So I will really talk a lot about the challenges that we faced, but then also the choice and the approaches that we um, chose so far. Then briefly a look into the system evaluation, although there is a lot of room for improvement there. And then I will summarize and we can jump into the discussion. Okay, so first, what is the motivation? Um, in our daily work life, so especially if you work in product development and engineering, you might be using a large quantity of tools. So there are tools for all kinds of activities. We have tools for project management like Jira and Asana. We have communication tools like Slack, DevOps tools, um, version control tools, and so on. And many of these tools, they have quite complex navigation patterns. They have complex search functionalities. Some of them, like Jira, even come with their own query languages, which really makes them a bit clumsy to use. And many of them do contain related information, but they are actually completely like uh, disintegrated. So there is no way to connect uh, the information in these different tools. And all of this creates an experience which is quite unsatisfying, and it leads to a lot of mental noise and distraction and also inefficiency in our work. Our goal is to build a seamless and direct text interface to all this data. So basically an interface which will allow you just to talk to your data, to get specific data by asking natural language questions, also do um, simple analysis, aggregations on the data. And then in the future, we also want to implement reverse ETL, which means that you not only read the data or analyze the data, but you also have a possibility then to actually write and act on the data. And today, as said, um, I will present the proof of concept that we did so far for this um, ambition. And this proof of concept was done on our own JIRA environment. So basically, we took our own um, JIRA accounts, then imported them into our database and implemented this text to SQL functionality on JIRA. Why Jira as said it's a proof of concept, so obviously we wouldn't have the possibility or the scope to integrate all the possible tools that we want to have in the end in this 
product. But Jira is probably one of the most popular tools used for engineering and product development management. And I would say it's also one of the clumsier and heavier tools. So we didn't want to choose something that's too simple, but we also couldn't choose like this whole combination and the whole universe of tools. That's why we went for a Jira because, okay, we told us if we can integrate Jira and basically embrace Jira with text to SQL, then we will also be able to do it with the simpler tools. Now, some of you, I'm sure that many of you, probably most of you have worked with Jira, but I assume that only a small part has ever seen the Jira database. It is a SQL database and it has quite a transactional structure. So it has tables for all the main entities that we can see in the interface, like issues, sprints, projects, and so on. And also tables for some, um, let's say metadata, like the priorities of issues, the statuses of issues, um, issue types, and so on. So now let's quickly jump into our demo environment, and then I will show you how the system now works um, end to end as of today. So this is our playground. And here, basically, you can input questions. Then we just go. And the system will generate um, the SQL query for the question. And then it will go directly to our Jira database and basically fetch the data that correspond to the query. So here, the question or the prompt is show, show me all projects. Then we get the query, select star from project. And then we have the four projects that are currently there for this Jira account. Now let's do something more um, interesting. So for instance, what bugs do we have in the sprint? Go and then we can see basically, okay, it's again a select close, but here it already sets um, two wear conditions. So basically it limits the bugs or the issues to the current sprint. And then additionally, it limits them also to the issue type um, bug. And this would be the four, the three results that we have for um, bugs in the sprint. And we can also play around with some <clears throat> more complex structures. So we have found that um, joins and nested queries are actually the most challenging for the algorithm. So let's try a join here. So here, who commented on text to SQL issues? Basically, we have two tables. We have the table of comments, and then we have the table of issues. And comments by a specific commenter are joined to issues of a specific component, namely the component text to SQL. And here you can see, okay, there is actually only one commenter for text to SQL issues. So that's the basic functionality. You input a question, you output a SQL query, and then the system also finds the results for this query. And additionally, the system already works in a multilingual fashion. So let's say that we want to ask a question in um, Chinese. So we type Shay. Uh, sorry, that was Russian. Shay <laughs> Zuimang which means who is the busiest one or who is the busiest person. So let's see what it gives us. Obviously this question leaves some room for interpretation, but here you can see that it will basically search for those people who have the most, the biggest number of open issues, which could be a possible interpretation of this question. Yeah, but even in the human context, uh, you would probably want to specify what is the exact meaning of the question and how can it actually be solved using this data. I think there is a question, but I would like to answer the questions um, at the end because many of the details will be explained now during the talk. Okay, so that was a quick look into the system. Now let's go back to the presentation and let's have a look at how the system is built end to end. So as said, um, on the one hand, we have the raw data. So we have the Jira database at the moment, and then in the future, we will also integrate other tools. And on the other end, we have our conversational 
interface. At the moment, it's the small playground that I showed, but in the future, we also want to have a mobile interface, a browser extension, and then a Slack extension. First, what happens to this data? We use, oh, excuse me, so we use Fivetran um, to import the data into a Snowflake database. And then additionally on the Snowflake database, we also do a bunch of DBT transformations to bring the data into a form which is really convenient for the text to SQL algorithm to work with. And in the Snowflake database, we will then have data for all the multiple activities, which the tools cover. So like project management, as we have it with Jira, then DevOps, versioning, testing, and so on. And then, of course, the database contains structured data. In the conversational interface, we have unstructured text data. So between them, we will have the text to SQL component in the direction of translating the questions into SQL queries. And then in the other direction, we will have, a, let's call it SQL to UI component. So the output can come, now it comes as a table, but it can also come as text, as data visualization, maybe some numeric data and so on. So this is then more of a UX challenge. Okay, now jumping into the details of text to SQL. First, an overview over the solution that we have at the moment. So at the input to text to SQL, we normally have the natural language question. And then most of the algorithms, they also um, take part of the database structure as their input. Yeah, so the database structure can be the names of the tables, the names of the columns. It can be the relations between primary keys and foreign keys. And sometimes even a part of the database content is also serialized into the prompt. Then it goes into the text to SQL. And at the output, we then have the SQL query, which is correct, well-formed SQL. And it also semantically represents um, the original question. So below, you can see a quick example of how this looks. So you have a natural language question, which are my most urgent issues. Then we have a serialization of the database schema, which starts with the issue table. Then we have a table, which is called issue field history, issue link, and so on. And each of them is followed also by the names of the columns. And at the output, you can see that there is the um, SQL query then. Now, so far, text to SQL, as you can see here, it's a black box. So let's look into this black box and see which components we have in there. Specifically, we have three components. So we have the pre-processing component, then we have a language model, which we fine tune to the um, text to SQL task. And then we apply additionally constraint decoding to make sure that our SQL queries are also actually a valid SQL. Now, um, on the next slides, I will actually, <laughs> I will kind of jump over this pre-processing component. The reason is that pre-processing is actually, is super important. So even though AI is booming, um, pre-processing is still like the fundamental basis of everything that you might do in NLP. But the thing is, it's also highly subjective and highly individual. So things that I will tell you that work for us in this specific case will probably not work for many other different cases. So I will just not bore you with the pre-processing details here. Then the second step is much more interesting. So here we really go into the linguistic details with the language model. And then finally, the constraint decoding, which is this um, valid SQL, SQL guarantee of the algorithm. And we will actually also look then into the database schema, because as I said at the beginning, we also applied a couple of DBT transformations to make sure that the database schema works harmonically with the um, text to SQL algorithm. Okay, so let's start with the first challenge that we face. The first challenge is linguistic variability in the input. You might know this challenge from question answering or any other types of conversational AI that uh, you might have been implementing. So the problem is that the same question, so the same, logically the same question can be formulated in many different ways. 
Let's look at an example. So here we have a prototypical question. Show me the person who is assigned the highest number of issues. This is a very concrete, correct question. So things are named by their names. It's like it doesn't really leave too much room for interpretation, ambiguity, and so on, and so on. So this kind of question the algorithm really likes. And you can see that it doesn't have any issues producing um, the right SQL query for this um, question. Now let's see what happens in the real world to this question. We have, of course, paraphrases of the same question. So things like who has the most tickets on the table, um, go look for the table. Who has the most work to do? Who is the busiest developer and so on? So all of these are linguistically correct, but they're already much more abstract and they leave this room for interpretation, just as we had it with the Chinese question in the examples, who is, who is the busiest person? How do we define this? How do we define who is the busiest person? But that's still okay. Um, then comes human failure. So when basically the um, user fails to input correct English, this can relate to orthographic errors. It can relate to non-native English competence, to um, grammar errors, misspellings, and so on. So things like who has most work, who is busiest, and so on. And then finally, also multilinguality. So that's something that we want to cover. And if users just come with their native language prompts, we want to be able to handle this kind of inputs. Because of course, English is the language of choice, but we still want to be um, able to ensure a most comfortable work with the user interface to our users. And fortunately, this kind of issues can really be solved very nicely with language models because language models, um, I mean, they have seen it all. So they have seen a lot of linguistic irregularities, a lot of paraphrasing, um, a lot of multilingual data if you go for a multilingual model and so on. So at the moment we use um, T5, T5 is an open source multilingual model. It comes in multiple um, parameter sizes. So the maximal size of parameters is 11 billion, which is not too big. But I have to say, we don't even use the largest version of the model because we really compare the, um, the increase in accuracy. It was there, but it was too small and it didn't really justify the increase in computational resources that we would also need to deploy this model. Now, the special thing about T5 is that it is optimized for a linguistic transfer learning because this is already built into its training process. So basically the whole model is trained on prompts for many different linguistic tasks. You can see this in the picture on the right. So for instance, you can have tasks for um, machine translation, like translate into German, that is good. You, have, you can have tasks for uh, summarization, sentiment analysis, uh, similarity de detection between sentences and so on. And for us, it just means that we take our questions and we kind of prepend this instruction, produce or write a valid SQL query for this specific question, we append the database schema, and then basically we fine tune it to produce the um, correct SQL query. Fine tuning has to happen because uh, otherwise, so without fine tuning, the raw model really just doesn't produce any SQL at all. So it's fairly visible that it was not in the original data. The fine tuning happens in two steps. So first we fine tune the model on, uh, well, actually this fine tuning was already done. It's available on um, Hugging Face. Um, and this fine tuning of the model on the spider data set, which is kind of the modern industry benchmark for a text to SQL um, performance benchmarking. So it's a data set which contains 7,000 question SQL pairs 
um, asked against different DB schemas, which is very important because many of the older data sets, they actually only cover one specific DB schema and don't really scale or show the ability of an algorithm to scale to additional schemas. And then in the second step, we also fine tune the model to our own fine tuning data. Now the fine tuning data is really I think it's really kind of a core factor of this whole system. So let's look into how we build it and how it looks um, in general. So um, <clears throat> the fine tuning data for a text to SQL, normally it's pairs of questions and SQL queries and the questions and as said, they can also be enriched with the um, database schemas. Now, in most cases, there is a many to one mapping from the questions to the SQL queries. So for one SQL query, you will have multiple questions. Why is that? Well, in most cases, when you annotate text to SQL data, of course, the bottleneck is in the SQL queries and not in the questions. Yeah, because the SQL queries, that's like the heavier part when doing the work manually or even automatically. So this is why for each SQL query, and normally we'll try to generate or annotate multiple versions of the questions. And this is something that we do at the moment using GPT-3 and other autoregressive models. So just uh, generating questions that have the same meaning. And this is actually also a step that allows us to further, even further enhance the capability of the language model to deal with linguistic variability. And additionally, we also want to avoid the distribution shift in the data. This is why for us, it's very important to constantly log user inputs, user feedbacks on their input and also to complement the fine-tuning data and the evaluation data with these inputs. As said, so far it has been only two months. So, um, and I really believe that this process of collecting the fine-tuning data, but also then of maintaining a stable evaluation set over a time, it will be key to the success of the system. That's why so far we don't really, I mean, I wouldn't say that we have found the gold standard in this process, but um, it's really important to have a stable evaluation strategy while also consistently um, extending the fine-tuning data here. Now, coming to the second challenge, that was the challenge at the output and specifically um, language models, of course, they, I mean, they have an open output space, so they can generate anything, especially if it's a regressive uh, language model, but that also can make them very creative and there is no guarantee at all that the output will be a well-formed SQL query. And at this point, we use an additional algorithm, which is called the PCAR, and which constrains the decoder by rejecting unacceptable tokens at each generation step of the model. So specifically, it just implements some de deterministic checks and then tokens that fail the checks, they are rejected. And in the end, at each step, the algorithm will just keep the top K highest probability tokens for the next step to be based on. Um, there are different constraint modes that can be used by PCAR. So there is lexing, which just, uh, let's say, just checks on the lexical well-formedness of the input. So whether the words that are used in the SQL query are correct SQL tokens or their correct names of columns and tables in the database. Then there is parsing without guards, which is already a bit more intricate. And uh, here basically um, Picard will also validate the full syntax of the query. And then there is parsing with guards. So here it will validate the syntax, but also um, whether all the tables the columns, the aliases, and so on that are used in the query could also be executed in the DB schema in this um, against the DB schema in this given syntax. 
Um, these are the three constraint modes. As you can see, they build on top of each other. And I have to say that each of them also has a significant effect on the performance of, of the algorithm, on the computational performance of the algorithm. So that's why it's really also important to consider the trade-off here in a specific use case. What are the benefits? Well, of course, we have this basic benefit that we have a guarantee that the SQL is valid. And this really, in our case, it improves also the overall um, accuracy on our evaluation data set. Then the PCAR algorithm is not involved in the pre-training or the fine-tuning of the language model. And this has the advantage that it can be used basically with any autoregressive language model. So if um, in a couple of months or even quicker, <laughs> Um, we come across a more advanced or more suitable model for us, then it can be just replaced without changing this whole um, architecture of the system. And then additionally, also coming back a bit to this issue of the creativity of the language models. So basically, PICAR also helps us to prevent the model from using too much of the world knowledge that, had, that it has inherently stored and that is not somehow related to our specific database and the space of the questions that we want to cover. And now, um, third challenge. So that was the um, additional topic of how to design a semantically meaningful database structure for a text to SQL. So what we have found that in order to formulate correct queries and not just simple queries, but also the more like complex questions and uh, queries, the algorithm has to understand the semantics of the database. When we started out, that was an intuition, but then we also, tested these optimizations, and we really saw that it also contributes to increasing the accuracy of the algorithm. So, so far, our approach here is quite simple. Basically, we start with a database structure that is intuitive for a human user, because, okay, that's based on the assumption that humans use language, language models also use language, so there should be quite a good uh, deal of overlap in how they also deal with linguistic structures and then how they apply these linguistic structures to the database structure. Um, two things here. So first, we were quite inspired by dimensional modeling, which works with the principle that related data should be kept close to each other. That means that we form white tables to um, kind of pre-compute common join operations. Then we use Boolean flags to simplify nested and group clauses and also to provide some, um, let's say, additional metadata and additional information to the database. Um, let me just give you an example. So for instance, in the JIRA database, there is no notion of, um, there is no column or a table of a backlog. So you just have issues, then you have sprints. Issues can be assigned to sprints. And if an issue is not assigned to any sprint, then it is automatically in the backlog. That's quite understandable for us because we know that's kind of how it works um, in the front end also. But for an algorithm, this kind of information would be really consuming to learn. On the other hand, just setting a flag in our database to say that, okay, this issue is in the backlog, that's a much easier and much more straightforward step for this kind of cases. But that's always a matter of judgment. So it's always a matter of weighing how much do you want the model to learn by itself and versus how much do you really want to manipulate the database structure. And then we also pre-compute some of the common aggregations, again, to alleviate this need for learning all kinds of aggregation functions um, on the part of the model. So white tables is one thing. And then the second is, of course, database readability. Again, coming back to humans. So normally, when you work with a database, you want an intuitive table and column names. And then you also want to see consistent naming conventions. And uh, we really saw that this change, so um, it changed the, I mean, it improved the accuracy on the um, on our evaluation data by 
four percent so far, which is quite considerable. I will show the evaluation numbers in a second, but uh, really on the transactional database, um, it's really hard for the um, algorithm to make all this kind of um, operations, including the joins, the aggregations, and so on. Whereas when you switch from the original transactional database structure to this more dimensional white table structure, then it really simplifies a lot of um, the work that it has to do. Okay, I will skip this, um, except that there are specific questions relating to very complex SQL um, syntax. And now coming to the system evaluations. So, um, text to SQL evaluation is not as trivial as uh, evaluation is for many NLP tasks. So there are two main choices to be made. Specifically, you have to decide whether you're doing a question versus a query-based split. So the question-based split, it would be like the standard train test uh, dev split that we normally do. And the query based split basically make sure that the um, train dev and test sets don't contain the same queries. So as we said, for each query, we might have uh, multiple questions. And uh, in this query based split, you would basically make sure that the split happens not based on the questions, but it really happens based on the queries so that queries cannot be memorized by the model. And then there is, um, in terms of the metrics, so whether you want to compare and to measure on the exact set match versus execution accuracy. So exact set match accuracy means that you focus on the SQL syntax. Basically, you decompose your SQL query into specific logical units, and then you see whether the set of these units um, matches the set of the gold standard units. And execution accuracy means that um, you execute the query against the data, you execute the gold standard query against the data, and then you just compare um, the resulting sets. Why this complication? Well, as you might know, in um, SQL, of course, for the same result or the same semantic meaning of a query, you can also have many different syntactic variations. You can have many different orderings of where clauses, group um, operations, and so on. So this is why here the evaluation metric is really a bit more um, intricate. Now let's look at our um, numbers. So we use question-based split, and we use execution accuracy here, and compare um, a couple of configurations, basically on the SPIDER data set, and then on our own um, Jira evaluation data set, which was just split from our fine-tuning data. So first, we look at T5 plus fine tuning on spider combination. And you can see that on the spider data set, it achieves something around 74%. And on our data set, it achieves um, 61%. Here, one important note for a spider, um, the numbers are given for the dev set. Yes, yeah, so these are external numbers. They are given for the dev set because um, the test set, it's not publicly available. And basically, this combination of models that we use, it was not tested against this um, hidden test set. Then we have the combination of T5 plus PIDAR plus PICAR, so this additional constraint-based decoding, which ensures um, SQL validity. And you can see that it increases the um, accuracy almost by 5% for this uh, spider training. In our case, it was only um, 3%. And then finally, our specific use case, so T5 plus spider fine tuning plus fine tuning on the JIRA data and then the car constraint decoding, we achieve 82.3%. Um, um, it looks like it's higher than the gold standard, but actually uh, considering that we only use one specific database and really only fine tune the algorithm to the specific database, which is already known, um, there is definitely also a lot of room for improvement here. Okay, now coming to the summary. So, 
we have seen that text to sql can provide a seamless fast and unified interface to many disparate tools and data that are used in uh, most companies and we build our text to sql component um well text to sql system on three components so we have the language model which was fine-tuned with our own custom text to sql data set then we apply constraint decoding to ensure that the sql output is valid so it's correct sql and it's valid against our database and we also optimize the database structure to make it um, as human and as text to sql readable as we can in terms of the next steps um one of them quite important or also, also for the user experience is performance tuning. So um, especially PICAR, since it's a um, tree-based algorithm, it actually really slows down the performance. And so far, uh, I mean, the official numbers in the paper are uh, something between 2.5 and 3 seconds per query. So to generate one output query, which of course is not, um, it's not acceptable in a real life user experience. So that's why now we are really exploring different hardware configurations and also different possibilities to speed up this performance. Um, then the user experience has a central role. So we have seen in the numbers that, okay, we can reach something between, let's say 75% and maybe 80, 80 plus something percent. Still in a real life um, application, especially if it is in a professional context, this accuracy is low and that's really important to compensate on the um, all the mistakes and the issues that the user has, uh, that the algorithm has by providing an adequate user experience. So this involves um, collecting detailed feedback from the user, but also allowing the user to kind of um, check the data that is output by the algorithm, and then at some point even also correct and somehow specify additionally the data that and the, um, the original intent that was basically behind the question of the user. And then, of course, so far we have only talked about this JIRA use case, but then one of the big steps would actually be the integration with other tools and then also the development of a scalable approach so that we don't need to um, build full scale fine tuning data sets for any tool, but we really have a more efficient method for building the fine tuning data and then also applying the fine tuning in such a way that tools are not only considered um, in an isolated way, but they can also be integrated with each other and in information can be acted on like very holistically. That's it. So I can see that there are many questions, but anyway, thanks a lot for the attention and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Just go through the Q&A. If you would read the questions before you answer them, and I'll just invite anyone uh, else to enter a question using the Zoom Q&A feature. And if you do want to be enabled to ask your question live, use the Zoom raise hand feature and I'll call on you. Go ahead, Jana. Okay, should I just read the Q&A? <laughs> yeah, there's no point yeah. to my reading it for you. So you go ahead and read them. Okay, so first question. Does the question to SQL work with rules or some kind of natural language processing? Um, well, uh, well, natural language processing can also be rules, but I hope that it has been it has become clearer that we work mainly with uh, language models than during the decoding step. You could call it rules because the PICAR decoding step it is a deterministic algorithm. Yeah. So that's, uh, it's a combination. Yeah, and I would say that for most of the specialized tasks that you have in NLP is a combination of, of like machine learning and then rules. Um, did you say you use a text to SQL.ai? No, I didn't say it and uh, we didn't use it, but we tested it. What is are the most ah said you're kind of checking them out, right? The questions. 
Sorry, once okay. you answer them, I disappear. Yeah, them. perfect. Okay. Um, what is are the most common use cases for the functionality to date? Well, at the moment we are in a discovery phase, so we are really checking out all these use cases with our potential users. So at the moment, it's um, mainly, I mean, for developers, it's mainly understanding what they need to work on and how to make their own work more efficient. Yeah, for managers, it's mostly about questions related to the performance of teams and of specific developers, and then also to um, increasing the efficiency of their planning. Is this specific to relational databases or can it be applied to other forms of SQL? Um, at the moment, it's specific. Yes, at the moment, it's specific to relational databases. But in general, so once you have um, appropriate fine tuning data, you can definitely also adapt it to other database um, formalisms. So we are really thinking about even applying it to some um, JSON-based and uh, key value databases. Yeah, because the process, I mean, it, it really falls under this bigger topic of semantic parsing. So you have a natural language input, you transform it into a logical form, which can be SQL, but it can also be a key value query or another um, logical form syntax. And then you just apply this query on the data. So once you have adequate fine tuning data, you can also do it on other database formalisms. Um, can the solution be hosted locally on premise? Well, the whole solution has quite a complex setup. So we use Fivetran, we use um, Snowflake, and so on, all of these are external services. So at the moment, as of now, as the solution is now, it can all be hosted locally. Um, but I have to say on this question, so can the solution be hosted uh, on premise? Yes. On the other hand, it would also be possible to have um, your own, let's say, Snowflake instance in your own um, company cloud, basically. And then in this case, the data would not be like, that would be a more integrated than solution. <clears throat> Um, is there a version available to be used with search engines like Elastic and Lucene? Same question as before for the other SQL formalisms. So at the moment, it's not available, but we would definitely plan it also in the future. Is there also an API? So we could use this as part of a larger solution. Um, at the moment, <laughs> Again, there is no API and really this text to SQL algorithm, it was thought like a component and a part of a larger system. But in general, if you implement an algorithm like that, and especially if the database structure is known, then of course it can also be implemented as an API. Um... Could there be an intermediate language between an L and SQL? So formalized an L in the middle layer. Interesting question. I would say that something that partially happens in the pre-processing. So for instance, something that we do in the pre-processing is that we, um, we convert temporal expressions. Yeah, so for instance, things like, um, last week or last month or this year and so on. Because as you might know, these autoregressive language models, they don't really, well, they're quite bad if it comes to somehow putting things into context. So the language model, if you say today, it might actually think that today is the day when it was trained or something like that. Yeah, so that's why they really have difficulties to dealing with times. And that's, for instance, something that we indeed do convert also um, then 
during the pre-processing. You could name it an intermediate representation. Yeah, because then all these things like last week, it will just be converted to a time span between a specific date and then the second date. Um, is the solution production already? Can we already use it, integrate it into our own use cases? Um, no, the solution is not production ready. As said, so far we have been working on it um, uh, for two months with a team of two and a half developers. So we would aim to have it production ready um, in the middle of next year. Uh, do you know that how good the model compared to the GPT model, which is used to generate training data? Um, the GPT model, we only use it for generating paraphrases for a question that is already there. Um, yeah, so this example that I show, for instance, uh, show me the person who is assigned the most uh, or the biggest number of issues, it will just be input into GPT and then we will generate paraphrases. Yeah, so that's the only use for a GPT that we have here. Um, yeah, but GPT and especially Codex, they of course also do have their own, um, their, they also have Part of their training data is also SQL data. So they're also able to some extent to generate um, SQL data, whereby GPT-3 obviously generates, uh, let's say, SQL data that is not as good, by far not as good as the data that's generated by Codex. Do you have a URL about the product? We don't have it yet, but if you're interested in testing and in providing feedback, then please just get in touch and we will just schedule a session where we can do a user test and then maybe also give you some kind of limited access to this POC. Is the solution GDPR compliant? Um, yes, it is. Is there a concept of keywords and if so are there any potential issues with language conflicts no there is no concept of keywords so i assume that you mean entities like uh, for instance issues which can also be called uh, topics or tickets or whatever we don't hard code these in any way um even not during the pre-processing phase uh, because exactly because of the issue that you um, mentioned, because they will be called other ways in other languages. And uh, um, yeah, we just want to avoid this kind of hard coding from the beginning. Seth, any more questions or uh, any other questions? Is live questions? Otherwise I feel like I'm talking to myself here. <laughs> I'll go back on screen. Uh, you have one more question. We we are over 50 attendees, um, and that's why we're in Zoom webinar mode, and uh, you're not able to see who else is here. Uh, uh, so, Jana, you have a, another question, I see. Um, I, I will say, uh, since I'm talking, that um, in an earlier life, I was a database administrator earlier in the days of uh, SQL databases, and uh, we've been trying to get natural language query interfaces for a long time, and it's interesting to see uh, the, yeah. the progress and, and uh, the, the challenges that remain that have been around for decades and trying to create natural language query interfaces. Um, and then also you, you mentioned people should get in touch with you. So make sure you share your contact information. So you have another question here. Will this be open source or will subscription be required? Oh, um, yes, a subscription will be required for this. Yeah, but as said, uh, please get in touch and uh, mid of next year, we will start our testing period. So then, uh, I mean, we already do like all kinds of discovery activities now. So there's already a possibility to get involved, but um, we will provide you a timeline basically on how you can then also um, get involved and use the product in the future. Yeah. Great. Well, I guess that's it for our questions. I see that we did have a number of uh, participants who are from Berlin, which is where you're located, yeah. uh, correct? So uh, yeah, hometown for participants. Oh, okay. Uh, someone asks, would you set up a newsletter to keep people interested people up to date? Um, we do have a newsletter. So again, please get in touch. Great. 
Well, well, thank you, Shauna, for the presentation. Uh, you know, as I said, as a uh, former database administrator and an occasional database user at this point, I mean, hands yeah. on, I find this really interesting. Uh, so, so thanks for your presentation. Uh, as mentioned earlier, we will post, I will post video of the presentation. I see we have another question. Uh, you can answer that after I uh, just say, we'll mm -hmm. post video of the presentation to the NLP XING YouTube channel. You can go there directly via, uh, nlpxing.org, I'm sorry, .com, or the bit.ly uh, address, bit.ly, bit.ly slash nlpxing. Uh, Jana, you are, you have another question here? Yeah, the question is, what do you think of the new LLMs, news, I think it's new LLMs, coming out of OpenAI as it applies to this problem? Um, well, as said, the uh, Codex has a quite powerful SQL generation capability as it has for other kinds of code, but um, um, it's definitely harder to fine tune than if you just have, if you're just using an open source model. Um, it has some very specific issues. So for instance, this issue of time expressions, um, it, uh, I mean, it's definitely there and I would not be sure how it would be solved. And uh, um, yeah, and then, I mean, it's, I think it's the standard problem that we have this most code generation tools that they will just generate some kind of average um, SQL queries or codes, but not really the SQL queries that are already optimal against the database. For us at the moment, it's very important to generate just correct SQL, but at some point we also want to be able to fine tune um, the, let's say the SQL queries also for performance. And I'm not sure how this can be done with Codex. Shana, you mentioned the newsletter and uh, you brought to mind, you posted, I'm gonna send a link out via chat. You posted a useful blog article recently, choosing the right language model for your NLP use case, uh, which has a nice chart uh, looking at uh, different text function use cases for different uh, large language models. And I assume this is the newsletter that you were referring to that people can subscribe to here. Um, yeah, so one is the blog, and then additionally, we have a newsletter for this specific project. Oh, I see. So this is uh, the, uh, the blog subscription, yeah. Yeah. Great. Well, well thanks. But will you share a follow-up? Can, can I share the contact details with you? And yeah, then go ahead. How, how can you do it? If you want to put them in the chat, go ahead. Okay. All right. So while Jean is doing that, I'll just pitch once again. I would love to uh, have self-nominations or suggestions for speakers for future programs. They can be online only programs or they can be hybrid programs if you want to present in person. Uh, for me, that would be in Washington, DC, Boston, or New York. I'm located near Washington, DC myself, but I run those other meetups. And then I know that the London Text Analytics Group, the Berlin NLP Group, and uh, perhaps also other groups are interested in having their own in-person programs. And I can put you in touch with the, uh, the lead organizers for those meetups if you wish, or just go to the meetup page and use the messaging on the meetup page to contact them. I, I see you had one more question from someone named Yori, Jana, and you have put in your contact information. So why don't you go ahead and take that question. What helps your SQL translation pick the right database column names and not synonyms? Oh, well, we just try to avoid the synonymous column names in the database. Yeah, so that's relating to this question of having um, unambiguous, consistent naming conventions in the database. So that's something that we try to um, avoid. Yeah, and which is normally semantically fully doable. Um, also, we have the ambition to integrate tools that cover a specific function. So different tools, for instance, for project management, we have Jira, Trello, Monday.com, and so on, into one unified structure, which will kind of help us reduce the number of tables and the databases that we need to maintain and to design. Um, but if you relate to this question of, for instance, issues, which can also be related as tasks, related to as tasks, topics, tickets, and so on, then that's something that is uh, solved at the level of the language model. 
All right, thank you. Uh, so thanks for everyone. Thanks to everyone who has attended today. I will be posting video in a few hours as soon as Zoom and then YouTube uh, has processed the video and I'll post links to the different meetup pages. And uh, thank you, Jana, once again for presenting and see you all next time. Thank you, Seth, a lot for the organization and for the invitation. Thank you.